Welcome to part two, uh, Management Tools and Adaptive Management Workshops. Uh, this is part of our ad uh, uh, project, Adaptive Management, to improve the icing operations. And once again, I'd like to introduce our, our uh, uh, participants. Uh, we're in the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering. There's Bruce Wilson standing in front of the truck, the guy with the white hair. Um, uh, we're working in co uh, collaboration with the city of Edina, and that's Jessica Vanderverf Wilson uh, standing on the right to our right, and um, and, and Doug Klimble, our, our graduate student on the project, uh, standing on the, our left, and then uh, Jacob Bierman uh, standing in the uh, truck door. Uh, the project was uh, so it was a collaboration between the city of Edina and the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering, funded by Local Roads Research Board and uh, administrated, administrated through the Department of Transportation and the University of Minnesota's Center for Transportation Studies. Uh, I just showed you uh, part one. That was a separate video. This is part two. We're going to talk about the management tools and adaptive management workshops. So there is uh, part one is done. That's in gray. Uh, this video will have uh, tools to manage chloride and adaptive management. So tools to manage adaptive management. Um, we developed two Excel estimation tools for cities and watershed districts. Now, let me preface this by saying that uh, these are, uh, the data used in, in uh, these models is actually not our data. It's data from a previous study done by the St. Anthony Falls Hydraulics Lab back in 2008. And uh, they looked at 11 watersheds and they collected a lot of large scale data. Um, we, we use that to develop some new regression equations that they did not develop. Uh, for the purpose of, of developing some um, uh, models, two, two model forms. Uh, but I do, did want to uh, acknowledge uh, that. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the long-term impact of road salt management on chloride in groundwater? Uh, that's a question that we don't have a good answer for, and the tool that we developed is really a uh, estimator, I would call it, for long-term chloride accumulation. Not how is chloride going to change, but what, where is chloride going to get to uh, at steady state? Uh, steady state means, so that the amount of chloride coming in from road salt and the amount of chloride coming out in base flow through groundwater uh, is in equilibrium. Or more so. Okay. And then second, what is the effect of reducing impervious surface on chloride movement in watersheds? Now, many people watching this video are from road departments and such, and that's really not your business. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, street maintenance and such, but it is the business of other people. And the chloride impacts uh, associated with redevelopment, uh, with uh, you know, tearing up roads, replacing roads, um, tearing up parking places, permitting things, uh, that does have a pretty major infect, uh, effect on chloride and uh, probably isn't explicitly um, um, uh, anticipated. Or, or thought about. Okay, let's start with the, the road salt through uh, watersheds. Uh, we have some salt that's added based on percent impervious surface. And in our report, you'll see that there's a relationship uh, between percent impervious surface and the amount of right road salt added to the whole watershed. So these are 11 big watersheds studied by the St. Anthony Falls Hydraulics Lab. It's an almost perfect relationship. The more impervious surface you have, the more road salt you have. Okay, so we're pretty confident about that. Although that study might be repeated at some point, we may be using less road salt now. It's not quite clear. We assume the plow off rate. We don't, we did look at snow piles, but we didn't have enough data to really accurately calculate a plow off rate. But I think it's probably somewhere between 25 and 50%. The model allows you to change that. So if you find better information, you can do that easily. The plow off, some of it, of course, melts off. Some of it becomes infiltration. There's vertical movement. Uh, and then uh, that goes uh, through soils and it goes to groundwater. How long that takes depends upon how uh, coarse the, uh, or fine the soils are uh, and how deep the Vado zone. The Vado zone is the soil zone uh, above the watershed and, and below the uh, uh, surface uh, or the active um, organic layer. Uh, it goes into groundwater and then that comes out as base flow in streams. Now that, that's a weird term, base flow. What I mean by that is if uh, you go to a, any stream in the summertime and there's some flow there and it hasn't rained in days, it's probably base flow. It's probably seeped in. Sometimes you can see it seeping in from the side and that becomes your base flow 
uh, that, that is draining that groundwater. So it's essentially groundwater. Um, and and um, uh, so what we can uh, uh, use this model as an estimator by knowing how much base flow we have. And we have, a f we have numbers that we're using for modeling, and we know that we're roughly in a range of normal base flow, and other people could change that in the model if they have better information. Uh, and we also have the chloride uh, at that time in, uh, in base flow. Uh, to illustrate the magnitude, the importance of this, we did a study a number of years ago on the Capital Region Watershed District, and we measured, uh, we, we were using data from the Capital Region Watershed. They gave it to us, shared, shared it with us, and we found some chloride, many chloride values, average chloride values, in the deep drains. These are like, some of these are 60 feet deep. In those deep drains, we found chloride concentrations well over 230 milligrams per liter uh, in the middle of the summer. Okay, so this isn't road salt that's being added yesterday. This is uh, road salt that has come from the watershed, washed down through the soil, and come out. And we don't know if it's from that year. Probably It's probably from many years ago. There's a pool of chloride down there in the groundwater. And we had some very high concentrations. So this stuff is, if it, uh, there are probably streams in the area. These were covered drains. There are probably streams in the area that have toxic levels of chloride uh, during low flow periods because of this groundwater uh, inflow. Now, I'm not going to go into how exactly how the model was developed. We went into that in uh, um, many pages of text in the uh, final report, and even more so in the uh, um, task uh, five report. Uh, but basically, uh, we took uh, uh, we had two sources of chloride. One is uh, septic systems. Now, that's not very important in an urban core area, but it could be important in outlying areas, some of the outer ring suburbs and such, where you have um, you know, maybe acre, half acre, acre lots, and you still have septic systems on them. Some of them are grandfathered in, um, uh, and, and some places just allow that. Uh, we have, a, uh, from other studies I've done uh, elsewhere, um, I have a pretty good idea of what the background concentrations in, in septic systems is, uh, what the chloride pickup, what the household contributes to, whatever well water they pump up, they add, uh, for example, uh, water softener, uh, salts will go into that. Uh, there's salts and detergents, salts and urine, all kinds of inputs of uh, salt. That's typically about 100 milligrams per liter. Um, and, you know, then all we need to know is the number of um, uh, households in the watershed. That's something that uh, the user will really have to define. And, um, uh, you know, how many houses per acre, uh, how many acres of watershed, uh, and so forth. And that will give you, that, that information uh, will give you uh, an answer. In this case, it was uh, 20, uh, about 24,000 uh, pounds of uh, chloride. Um, if a user were to say, no, no, I don't think my people in our area are using 70 gallons, I think they're using 90 gallons, um, you can change that. If you change that, the 70 doesn't physically go away, but it's not used in the calculation. It'll use the number you put in into, into, in that yellow uh, column. Uh, for the uh, chloride from road salt, uh, again, these are developed from a series of statistical relationships. Uh, the only thing you really need here is uh, the percent insurvious uh, uh, surface of, of the uh, watershed, and the converse of that is the Im uh, percent impervious and, and uh, uh, pervious uh, surface. So they, they should always add up to 100%. And uh, again, these are all determined by regression relationships, all using that data from the uh, St. Anthony Falls study, uh, and here we come up with, uh, we've made an estimate of base flow, which we know is at least a credible number for some streams, uh, probably between 10 and 20 is, is a reasonable range. Uh, and we, we can't define that better at, at this point, uh, based on data that we have. We know there's a background chloride concentration, and here we end up with, uh, the prediction is that the steady state over long periods of time, if you can continue at the, at the rates of input that you have now, you'll reach 189 milligrams per liter of chloride. Now that's just numbers I picked out of my uh, head. Um, you could do that for a real watershed, and uh, we uh, also modeled a lot of scenarios, and it was, now 189 is way above uh, the background, but it's not at a level that's critical for either drinking water or aquatic life. But if this were, instead of 30% impervious surface, 70% impervious surface and 30% uh, pervious, 
uh, in other words, we flip those numbers, which is just parts of downtown uh, St. Paul or Minneapolis, uh, these numbers would be in a three, four, five hundred range. Uh, so there are scenarios where we end up with steady state values that are far above where we want to be uh, in terms of uh, water safety, both for aquatic life and for uh, drinking. So this spreadsheet, let me back up for a moment. This spreadsheet is available um, on the website, the MnDOT website, and it's free. You can download it. Um, there's nothing hidden here. The calculations are all embedded in the way you can see them. Uh, there's no, uh, you have full permission uh, to use uh, this if you, if you feel like it. And if you don't like it, you can modify it too. Um, the second uh, tool is um, uh, urban planning uh, tool for chloride balance estimation. So I'm taking a watershed and I'm just assigning some characteristics, uh, the, the percent impervious surface. And then uh, I'm using this set of regression equations I was talking about, where we take from the St. Anthony Falls database for these 11 watersheds. So we have chloride input versus mean chloride and mean uh, 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 per, uh, uh, total input versus uh, chloride export and things like that. So these are all just embedded regression equations. And this is the, um, this is the outcome for uh, the current model. Uh, you just, this is just an example, 30% impervious surface. Uh, and here's the values. And then we go to a 10% reduction in impervious surface. And I'll, I'll show you uh, one example of how you might get there. But just imagine that we're trying to do more pervious surface in urban areas. And uh, if you do that, you decrease a lot of these things. So what you change here, oh, uh, wrong cursor here. Uh, you get about a, just that little change. You get a 53% reduction in chloride uh, input. That's the salt being added, you, uh, which is just reflects the um, uh, difference between 20% and, and 30%. You get a 55% reduction in mean chloride, 123 milligram. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, percent reduction in the uh, chloride export. So this is the amount of chloride in pounds per meter squared or grams per meter squared. 123% reduction. And you don't change the retention uh, very much. So this is the kind of thing during redevelopment uh, that we might uh, use. So let me show you an example of, of this. Uh, this is a, a made-up example. I just took pictures off the web of parking lots. Uh, but here's what a lot of our parking lots uh, look like around the metro area. Uh, they're surface plots. Uh, there's, um, they're all over the place. Uh, they're very inefficient in terms of using land. Uh, they're tending to go away, not so much for chloride management, but they're tending to go away because it's a, a very inefficient use of land. Um, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can build uh, apartment buildings, you can build uh, uh, high parking lots. There's all, ways, all kinds of ways you can prove the, the value added of that uh, uh, land. So here I'm saying, okay, let's, take a, uh, let's put a, a, a five-story parking lot up. And that might look like this. Again, this is just a picture off the web. We didn't actually build it. But the top still, still needs to be salted and plowed and stuff. But the other layers don't, or at least not very much at all. And so you could get an 80% uh, reduction in salted impervious surface area. You could take that one step further, put a green roof on it, um, and, and reduce that almost uh, here. The, the, in this picture, they, have, they seem to have a uh, part of it un uncovered, but you could make it completely covered. And you could essentially have no salt added or very, very little um, added at all. Um, and also you would have a flow rate reduction from the green infrastructure on, on the roof. So these are the kinds of things we can, we can envision. And you could take that you know, across a, a city or a part of a city and say, okay, we're going to take this one out and build a, a, something here. We're going to take this flat parking lot out here. And maybe we're going to narrow a street. Uh, you know, and then we gain, uh, we gain more pervious surface there uh, or at least... Uh, maybe we expand sidewalks into the streets so we can have more outside dining. Uh, and uh, yet it's not really salted, or at least not very much, uh, the, the, the dining area. Um, uh, uh, be, yeah. um, there's all kinds of uh, examples that we could have uh, that would give you less salted impervious surface and lead to uh, improved uh, chloride uh, results, effects on your streams and your, and your groundwater. Uh, and this is a, another example of source reduction. We're reducing the source rather than trying to take it off. And like I said, it's 
very hard to remove chloride. Once you drop it out the back of a truck, it's very hard to get back. Okay, now the adaptive management part. This was, uh, I'd say, the fun part. Again, this is the same slide I used in the first uh, uh, talk. Uh, you have uh, de-icing events starting. We monitor the meltwater. The data is synthesized into these snow melt metrics, and we share these metrics with the Dyna Public Works staff. And here's kind of what it looks like uh, in real life. Um, this is from our first year presentation. This is a huge chloride spike. Uh, I think uh, most of the loading for the first year came off this one spike, which was a uh, winter mix event. We told these guys, I mean, uh, uh, in, this, in this room right then, we showed a slide. Um, we showed a few more slides. That's not the one up on the board. But uh, these guys responded, and they responded vigorously. Uh, they said, look, what happens here is we get these uh, winter mix events. A lot of snow melts. It freezes hard, and it's, it's a layer. We can't get through it with our plows, and we have to go through with a salt run to soften it up so we can come back and dig it out with our plows. And that's why you're seeing this huge amount of chloride there. And from that, they continued the conversation. Um, and they said, "Let's. why don't we buy these Yoma blades? They're reputed to be better for clearing ice. These have carbide, carbide bottoms rather than steel bottoms. They track closer to the surface, uh, supposedly. And uh, that would be a, a good idea. And uh, they purchased a few. Uh, Jessica uh, uh, Vanderverf Wilson, uh, talked to the Nine Mile, Mile Creek Watershed District and got enough money to purchase, I think they bought four of these, and they used them in the following uh, year. Now, I'd like to be telling you next that we, uh, um, we proved that they, reduced, they removed uh, or required less salt, but in a two-year study where you don't buy the blade until the end of the first year, it's kind of hard in one year to, to tell that uh, in, a, in a, an observation experiment. Uh, so we would need to do other studies, or somebody would need to do other studies to really uh, prove that, uh, probably in a test facility where you can control conditions. Um, here's, uh, but the, uh, here, here are three slides, uh, one, uh, three photos, one the standard uh, steel blades, one the Yoma blade, and here's a picture that one of the operators took, snowplow operators, uh, of clearing in, in the foreground, that's a regular blade, and in the background, that's a Yoma blade. Their sense was it does clear better. You know, it clears closer to the surface uh, and clears better. Uh, they, it was a side benefit that several of them mentioned that they were quieter, too. They liked that. And, and the residents, they thought, would like that, rather than clattering at you know, 6 o'clock in the morning um, that you sometimes uh, get. Um, the, the jury's out on Yuma Blades. Uh, MnDOT did a survey a couple of years ago of uh, northern states, um, snowplow operators, and uh, th it was mixed. Uh, some people felt it was better. Some people didn't. Some people felt it cost more. Some people thought it didn't. Uh, I think it probably depends on the conditions. Um, I would think that if you were running, uh, for your first experience with a Yoma blade was uh, in a winter mix, you might go, wow, these are great, you know. Uh, and if it, you just had regular, ordinary light snow conditions, light melting conditions, it might not make any difference. It might also depend on the... Uh, the uh, a certain type of road surface uh, and other things. I, we don't have a, an answer to that. But they did uh, decide to buy these as a result of data input that we had and decisions that operators made through discussion. This went on. This was a very um, vocal and, and uh, discussion with lots of involvement uh, from people. Um, other ideas came out too, some of which we, uh, uh, we from resulting from our data, but a lot of things that didn't. Uh, it was just having these guys in a room for uh, two sessions, uh, or three sessions, especially the, the end-of-year sessions. Um, uh, Edina decided uh, that uh, their salt had some water in it, and the way that decision was uh, the observation on the field was one of the operators said, you know, this stuff is clumping all the time, and the only way I can get it out the back is hit the blast button, and when I hit the blast button, I know I'm pouring salt all over the place. Uh, but he said, I just, it's just hanging up in the back of the truck because it's too wet. And uh, in the second year, they decided that they would develop a, a way to measure the water content. And it's very simple. It's just put some uh, salt in a, in a beaker or a cup or something, uh, weigh it on a scale, put it in the microwave, evaporate off all the water, and reweigh it and see how much water you had. And if it's too high as a percent, uh, the idea was that they would tell the um, salt delivery truck, uh, go home. We're not buying it. 
And uh, that, of course, you can see that very quickly they, they wouldn't be bringing in uh, wet salt. And I, I don't know exactly how that turned out, but they, they, that was a work in progress when we uh, ended this study. Um, sharing real-time data, the second year particularly, um, they became uh, the data acquisition uh, or feedback uh, from Precise improved, and uh, they learned that we could get, Edina could get, um, all of the data uh, very quickly uh, if they just asked for it. And they did. The uh, supervisors uh, asked for it. And uh, again, that was right near the end of the study, but uh, I take it that is being done right now. And the operators, the idea is that we, they would share data. You would look what, what each truck did and you know, who's using more, who's using less. Well, there was some pushback on that because um, some operators had tougher routes, you know, hills and such. But I think in the end, they, they realized that not all routes are created equal. Uh, some require um, uh, uh, better service, levels of service. Uh, some were fairly easy uh, and some were very difficult, had hills and such. But the idea, they, I think as a group, they felt they could discuss this intelligently and figure out ways to reduce uh, their salt uh, uh, additions. They recognize that winter mix are these major salt contributors. I'm sure they'll be thinking about that more. I mean, they bought the Yoma Blaze in response to that, but they'll be doing more uh, responses, I think, along the way. Um, definitely, uh, one question that came up is uh, one of the supervisors, uh, John Scherer, uh, said, uh, can you tell me, you know, what the temperature, if I got some uh, water on the road and uh, I want to know, is that going to freeze at rush hour? And uh, one of the problems is, uh, that they had now is, or then, is that they had the, road the temperature sensors on the truck were air temperature sensors. You really need the road temperatures. And then you could see, you know, uh, whether or not you could, might be melting without the use of salt. Also, if you have some data along um, uh, the, the route, um, a, a database of, of road uh, temperatures and, and other conditions, you can develop a model uh, to predict if you know now at 8 o'clock in the morning, this is the temperature, and we know the angle of the sun and all that, that sort of thing. And Mike, uh, Bruce Wilson does a lot of this kind of uh, modeling. Um, you only have to predict out eight, eight hours or so. It's not like we're going to predict out you know, through the season. It's just, you know, J John might ask us, you know, what's going to happen eight hours from now? Or we give them the model, and he plugs in a few numbers and says, okay, now it's, uh, uh, you know, 15 degrees road uh, temperature, what's it going to be like in a couple of hours? Is it going to heat up to 30 or 35? Um, and these are the kinds of things, little ex uh, projects we can do that would um, enhance um, chloride management. Some reflections on the process. First of all, active management is well suited for de-icing operations for several reasons. One, the audience is small. There's no more than about 20 people or so uh, in the room. They're captive. Um, they're paid to be there, uh, and they're motivated. Uh, we did not realize the extent of motivation, but it's, it is really high, <laughs> very, very high. Uh, um, that was uh, very pleasant to be um, in that kind of group where people are really trying to improve things. Uh, the operators uh, control salt inputs directly. They can turn it on, they can turn it off. Um, they, can, they can use different salts. There are different ways to reduce uh, salt inputs. You can uh, anti-ice, you can... Uh, uh, pre-wet, you can change the type of salt uh, and everything else. Uh, the feedback can be provided rapidly. Um, and there are many learning events, uh, maybe five or ten major events each winter. Uh, so you can learn along the way and get better and better and better. Um, I was involved in a, I was in, became interested in the idea of adaptive management years ago, uh, 20 years ago or so, uh, on a project in Phoenix where we were working with a water treatment operators. There were about 10 different uh, water treatment plants uh, along the canals uh, that drain out of the Salt River and the Verde River and the big reservoirs and such. And uh, they wanted to improve the conditions. We worked with them uh, doing a lot of sampling in the reservoirs, these taste and odor compounds and such. And we gave them data in a very similar fashion to what we did here. And they reduced the problem, the, the late summer, fall taste and odor problem, this, this moldy uh, water that uh, tasted these desert waters get some time, they reduced it by about 75% in the first year. Uh, but again, the actual management practices, they did it, not us. So we're good at collecting data and analyzing it and stuff. We don't know how to operate a water treatment plant or how to uh, operate a, a, a 
I'm not even sure I could start up a salt truck. Uh, we're not good at that. You guys are. So, I think these are very useful. The inclusion of supervisors was important because they can provide support for creative ideas, and they really did. They did. Uh, different levels of supervisors did different things depending upon their, their uh, purview. But uh, if they're there and there's an audience, uh, the, the operators have a lot to say and share. Uh, and as do the supervisors. And uh, it's very important in this kind of thing where we have academic people, uh, we would have you know, much more complex graphs in an academic seminar or something. It doesn't work. Uh, we need to kind of be quiet. Uh, 30 minutes of, of presentation of material over the year, including you know, some pictures and stuff like that. A little bit of data, just enough to prime the pump and get the conversation started. About 30 minutes with at least an hour of discussion afterward, we thought was about the right uh, ratio. I don't think I'd change that. Recommendations for practice. Uh, just to summarize, we can target these winter mix conditions to reduce chloride most effectively, monitor the quality of the de-icing salt to reduce clumping, and then allow a, a lower salt applications, more controlled salt applications, measure road temperatures directly using truck-mounted IR sensors, uh, sh uh, share the truck data with the cr uh, crew, so this is the database, comes back through the supervisor and out to the crew on a, probably a sheet. Uh, develop adaptive management workshops with supervisors and operators, uh, um, supervisors and operators, um, and, and perhaps with facilitation from outside, but uh, I think some departments could do this and some might need some outside help. And consider the use of expanded uh, Yoma blades. And finally, continue research. Uh, there are maybe three or four studies on um, Road salting, maybe a few more. But this is a, something that happens all over the metro region. It's something we control on the input side as we add this salt. Uh, we can't control on the downstream side. Uh, so we need to think about this. And we need to know much more about the dynamics. We know that there's this, uh, the interaction of the plow off, the remelting of the, of the snow piles into the drains, the meltwater from the streets. Um, this is a fairly complex process. Uh, we've identified, I think, some of the some of the major points that need to be worked on more, but uh, this uh, one study isn't going to do it. Uh, even three or four studies, we're getting there, but we're not there, and this needs to continue. Um, one thing that's been um, uh, we've discussed with MinDOT is uh, including uh, the the icing projects in their new um, um, uh, experimental facility on on uh, 494. Um, you know, maybe putting sensors in the road and using different kind of pavements and then do these side-by-side -side, uh, experiments. Maybe even use uh, uh, snow um, making machines to control the amount that you put onto the street or flood streets and ice them up or something like that. Uh, we can't do that in, in downtown Idana, Edina or in the Edina neighborhood. Uh, they, they just won't let us do that. Uh, so we have to do it under controlled conditions to get some of these uh, answers. And that's the end. I thank you for this. And um, uh, feel free to call me anytime you want uh, if you have questions uh, at the University of Minnesota. And um, yeah.